There's a responsibility that comes with that because people in candid moments can be shown in an in, uh, unflattering light or we can point the camera at things that are uh, hard uh, situations such as homelessness, uh, panhandling, etc. And I always refer back to Paul Strand that said this about street photography. He said that the spirit of intent must be sufficiently humane to warrant the intrusion. Hi everyone, welcome to Eidos, where we take a look at the shape and form ideas take in the visual arts. I'm your host, Ira Gardner, and today we're gonna to be talking about film photography. To begin with, I wanna answer a question that I get asked all the time, and that is, Ira, what's your favorite camera? And the reality is, the favorite camera is whatever camera is in my hand. And so many times, my favorite camera is my cell phone camera, even this one, which is broken because I ran over it with my car, but it still works and I still use it probably every day because I always have it with me. It fits in my pocket. And so today, what we really want to talk about is I'm starting a new series about film cameras and film photography because I think there's something special about film photography that we can learn from as a self-reflection practice. One of the things about film photography is that you don't get instant gratification. You have to pre-visualize what that image is going to look like. You have to use your critical thinking skills to determine the appropriate exposure, composition, and then you might have a day, two, week, or a month before you get around to processing the film, and then you're gonna look at that film and analyze the exposures to see which image is worth investing the time and effort into making a print, scanning it to share online, etc. It really demands the critical thinking and creative thinking skills uh, in a way that digital photography is just different because of that immediacy of click, 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 I see something immediately, I share it immediately without that pause for self-reflection. And so I want to start out with a new series of episodes that really looks at film photography. So today I thought it would be fun to start our series by looking at 35 millimeter point and shoot camera technology. And I'm, I'm holding this camera here, which is one of my favorite cameras. It's the Minolta Hymatic F that was uh, manufactured in the 1970s. And what I love about this camera is because I think it's the closest bridge to digital cell phone photography in the way that it is so easy to make an image without having to do a whole lot of thinking. What made this camera special is it was one of the first cameras to offer auto exposure. And so all you have to do is hold it up, click, and wind to the next exposure. And I'm also focusing on rangefinder cameras because that was really and still remains the premium camera format for uh, candid photography, street photography. And I think these cameras are optimized or travel photography because they can fit in your pocket so easily. So when I talk about my favorite camera being the one that's in my hand, that means I wanna have a camera that is always with me and can fit into my pocket because those images can be some of the most poignant, special slice of life moments as compared to when you set up a tripod, a large camera, you pose people, etc. This allows me to make candid photographs, which is a category of imagery that I think is really, really special. When we talk about candid photography, we really go back to the work of Henri Cartier-Bresson, who is really, uh, in many respects, one of the greatest photographers of the 20th century, who really is credited with um, the lineage of street photography. Cartier-Bresson's work was so brilliant because of his ability to see magic moments on the daily, day-to-day uh, -day life scenes and to capture them 
in an instant with perfect composition. And we're gonna talk about composition in another episode, but when you look at Cartier Bresson and you look at the golden mean proportion and the way that he organizes the lines, the shapes, the forms within the frame at a fraction of a second of everything moving into such perfect compositions that are not cropped, they're not edited in the darkroom. They're actually full frame images. And so uh, Cartier Bresson was just one of the brilliant photographers that we all uh, should be aware of. And in fact, he was part of a movement in what we call French humanist photography, uh, which was celebrating the distinctive cultural attitudes of French culture after World War II. In order to reclaim that sense of pride and Frenchness, Photographers like Cartier Bresson, Robert Duaneau, uh, while uh, Willie Ronas would go out and photograph to uh, look for those things that illustrated Frenchness in their photographs. And so, some beautiful uh, images uh, done with the uh, rangefinder camera. Now, one of the things we like about rangefinder cameras compared to 35 millimeter SLR cameras, single lens reflex, is that you can uh, focus in low light very easily because it uses a cam with two images that when the images overlap, the image is in focus. So uh, it doesn't have any issues with low light photography focusing the way an autofocus system uh, would have. So this camera here is my Minolta A5, uh, which has a cracked glass in the front, but it was a camera given to me by my father. In fact, majority of my cameras I've inherited from either my father, uh, who had been a camera repair technician in Los Angeles when I was a child, or my friend's fathers uh, and my friends that have given me cameras that come with those special memories attached with it uh, in a way that, again, I, I think a digital camera doesn't have that lineage or that, that nostalgia quality to it that these cameras have because they are so rugged and durable as compared to digital cameras that we replace on a pretty frequent basis, about every 18 months is what the manufacturers want you to be replacing your camera. Whereas you bought one of these, it would last a lifetime. And so when you inherit these cameras, you're inheriting that lifetime of use from the person that had it before you. And that's one of the things that are very special to me. But getting back to this camera is a little more simple than this camera in that there is no auto exposure, there is no meter. It is as bare bones of photography as it gets in that you have focus, you have uh, the aperture and shutter speed uh, settings, but you need a handheld meter or you need to use what we call the Sunny 16 rule and just manually set your camera to a proper exposure. I actually used this camera for a project a couple years ago with my wife where we set about documenting the interesting sights along Highway 2 in Washington State. It's one of those road trips and again great travel camera, uh, a road trip photography project where I was celebrating small town culture by making photographic records of all the towns that we came uh, to along Highway 2. At a little higher quality is this camera, which is a legendary camera. It's the Canonet QL17, which came with a f1.7 40 millimeter fixed lens. And this camera had the auto exposure capability of the of Minolta Hymatic, but it also had all the manual exposures of the Minolta A5. And what's interesting about this camera, it's, again, it's got a really nice small uh, form factor. And most of these older rangefinders came with 50 millimeter, 40 uh, millimeter, or 35 millimeter, which all fit within a category of what we consider a normal focal length lens to a slight wide angle lens. The normal lens is what the human eye sees, angle of view. And so why I think these cameras are the perfect walk around travel photography camera where you see something, a candid, and you wanna grab it real quick, is that when you hold it to your eye, the rangefinder is showing you roughly what you saw with your naked eye. And so it's very quick to organize your composition and make the exposure. So the Canon QL17 is just a legendary camera, but I will point out that on Canon's website, all these cameras were emulating the German rangefinder cameras, most notably the Leica rangefinder camera, as well as some of the Contax and Voigtlander cameras as well. 
the Canon QL17 represented the last rangefinder camera they made before they switched all the way to single lens reflex and their legendary Canon A and AE1 series cameras. The reason that's significant is because they decided that the Leica M3 rangefinder was the epitome of design for a rangefinder that could not be improved upon. And when we think about Japanese manufacturing after World War II, it has been a continuous improvement of more and more quality in their manufacturing, and they reached their, their height or their peak of quality with this camera and then abandoned the rangefinder in favor of the single lens reflex. Another camera that I have in my collection that I've been photographing with a lot lately is this little camera, which is another Japanese camera. It's the Yashica T4 Super D weatherproof camera. I love this camera because again, it fits in uh, my jacket pocket really easy, and it has the added benefit of being a little more uh, protective in, in weather elements, and I wanna encourage you to get out and photograph in inclement weather. Don't wait for the sunny, perfect weather because the images might be uh, less interesting than photographing in the inclement weather. Uh, we'll talk more about that in another episode. This camera, the Yashica T4, has the added benefit of a built-in flash uh, that if I fire it and it says there's not enough light, um, it will fire it uh, automatically. And this camera is auto everything. It's auto focus, uh, which I want to point out the Minolta went from the Hymatic to the Hymatic AF series. And this is the AF2. Uh, my wife's grandmother passed on one of these to her and she loves using that camera. It's a great camera. Uh, it's auto focus, auto exposure. This is auto focus, auto exposure, but it has that Zeiss uh, quality lens on it that is just so incredibly sharp that recently I did a side-by-side -side comparison of these two cameras and you could see a noticeable sharpness improvement. Uh, it's a slower lens uh, and again every camera is going to have different uh, functions and features that affect how you f use that camera, how you photograph. In this case, this camera only has an f3.5 35 millimeter Tessar Zeiss lens, incredibly sharp lens, but in low light situations, that flash is going to be going off. This became really popular in the late 90s with fashion photographers and street photographers that gave that snapshot aesthetic. Another photographer to take a look at would be Martin Parr's work, British photographer that really captures beautiful snapshot aesthetic photographs. Uh, and then looking at the photographers from the 70s like Gary Winogrand, 70s and 80s, those street photographers as well. Uh, and then what this has that's really unique is it has a little uh, window here for a waist level finder. And what that allows you to do is very quickly frame the image, don't have to worry about focus, and I can hold it below my eye level for street photography, which is going to do a couple of things. The lower camera angle will elevate the image of the person in such a way that shows a little more respect, a little more uh, looking up to that person. I love that. And you see that in Diane Arbus's street photography work as well. But this is 35 millimeter with a little range finder. I can be a little sneaky about the fact that when I hold my camera up to my eye, people react to that and they change their behavior. Whereas I can just be kind of going along and I can just kind of hold it below and I kind of know where it's at and I can just make a quick photo uh, and outdoors the flash wouldn't come on and it's a very, very uh, subtle way of making street photographs candid without people paying attention to you. And I think that's really an important element of street photography is to be able to capture people in their honest, authentic self. Now, I'm gonna pause a moment and talk about street photography uh, from the sense of there's a responsibility that comes with that because people in candid moments can be shown in, a, in uh, unflattering light or we can point the camera at things that are uh, hard uh, situations such as homelessness, uh, panhandling, etc. And I always refer back to Paul Strand that said this about street photography. He said that the spirit of intent must be sufficiently humane to warrant the intrusion. And so when I go out to photograph, and I recently did a gallery exhibit uh, looking at the homeless issue with another photographer friend of mine, 
the purpose was sufficiently humane because we wanted to show that homelessness was not a statistic, it was a human condition, and that we can't use labels to define uh, what another human being's experience is. And so we actually went out and photographed uh, people on the street. I did a video project, he did still photography with film. But I'm always thinking about what is the intent of my work and do I have uh, the proper spirit and attitude to the work that I'm doing in my street photography. A great example, I think, of a photographer that really captures the tone and essence of the human spirit in their street photography is the Philadelphia photographer David Heath, who passed away recently. Uh, but he created a book called Multitudes and Solitudes, uh, Multitude and Solitude, that is just so poignant, so powerful, uh, that I really recommend you take a look at. It's just some beautiful work, starting with his images in New York City, uh, as well as his images during the Korean War. Um, while we're at it, let's also just talk about uh, the fact that the cell phone can do some incredible work as well. Damon Winter was a Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist who documented the Afghanistan uh, conflict with an iPhone and did an incredible uh, job of that. So really, it just reiterates this idea that the best camera is the one that's in your hand. So with the Yashica, we get into a point and shoot category that starts to get a little more sophisticated. And so we have the Canon uh, 135Z, uh, Z135 Sure Shot, which actually introduces a zoom lens where you can get more complicated uh, compositions. You can zoom in, you can take the images from different uh, distances. Uh, and this has been a great camera. It's a really sharp uh, lens as well. Not quite the Zeiss quality, but darn, is it really good. A lot of days I will be carrying both of these cameras because they fit in both my jacket pockets so easily. I will use this camera for photographing uh, people on the street. I'll use this camera to zoom in on things that are beyond my visual normal field of view that catch my eye. Uh, maybe I'm up high uh, on a parking garage looking down and want to get something closer up. But it's a really great combination of these two cameras. Other days I will walk around with my Minolta High 8 because it's just so unassuming. People are not afraid of this little camera. It's great, uh, cute camera. And then uh, when I want to be a little bit more technical with my exposure, I'll walk around with a Canon. If I had to only pick one camera, this probably would be it because it allows me to do all my uh, manual exposures as well as my auto exposures. Uh, and it's just a great, great camera. Another incredible photographer that I really recommend people take a look at when thinking about street photography and thinking about film photography is the work of William Klein. Uh, particularly his imagery of New York uh, as well as Paris because he's just an in-your-face uh, raw uh, photographer uh, that just did amazing work. This camera really reminds me of the photography of the great Japanese photographer Daido Moriyama uh, who just photographs with the only intention is to transmit the facts of what he's seeing into these photographs. And when you see him blown up, when you see him in book form, uh, you just get this powerful, visceral, emotional response to his work. And, and so I wanna encourage you to rethink how some of these simple tools of the camera can do powerful things. And candid photography has the ability to tell stories, uh, has the ability to capture juxtapositions in everyday life that gives meaning to our lives. And I think that the film photography is what allows us to engage our mind, our self-reflection, our pre-visualization, our creative thinking, our critical thinking, and bring that to bear to invest in making something truly special, archival, uh, something worth putting on the wall uh, and not just your Facebook wall, but actually uh, put it out there in a way that celebrates life.
So thank you so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you in upcoming episodes. Uh, please drop me a line, send me an email, make a comment. Uh, go to the website to take a look at the other resources I've put out there for you and send me some images. I'd love to share those in upcoming episodes. Thanks so much. We'll see you soon.